when St. Francis started to become St. Francis, he began as a young man who was struggling with his place in the world. He went off to the Crusades and was given all this wonderful armor, but he realized that he wasn't a fighter. Like, he liked the armor because it made him look good, but wasn't so thrilled with the whole having to battle people part. When he came back from the Crusades after having been injured, he went through a life-changing moment where he battled an illness and experienced the presence of God. And his father did not like the changes that that caused in him because he was supposed to take over the business and sell all of the goods that his father brought in. And so at one point, his father demands that either he follow the path that his dad had laid out for him or he give him back everything that he had ever gave him. And so St. Francis whips off all his clothes in the middle of the town square and throws them back at his dad to say, I'm done with it. But what happened to Francis then is he started to see the world differently. He started to experience the presence of God in everything he encountered. So he started to live out amongst the flowers and in the fields and in the caves. And he was transported to this spot where there was a broken down, crumbling church. And he heard the voice of God tell him to rebuild the church. So being that most of us are pretty literal when we get an experience of God, right? He thought that meant that crumbling church in front of him, that he was to rebuild it, right? But what God was calling Francis to was to transform the way people thought about God and a thought about church, to transform how people would act and react. Because the Catholic church at that point in time felt very disconnected from ordinary people, but also had, had all these rules. I mean, like, you know, you know the story because we're Protestants of Lutheran trying to throw it over. Well, Francis was one of the first people trying to change it from within. Because he thought we should follow what Jesus actually taught. And he said, if I am going to be a follower of Jesus, you know, there's that pesky passage that sends the followers off with just the clothes on their back and a pair of sandals and a stick. Well, that's what he did. Because if you know the Franciscans, they're known for wearing their brown robes and their sandals, right? I mean, my first encounter with Franciscans was in Assisi, in the town square, where they were singing the Italian version of one of the kids' songs. And it's about a monkey and bananas. And so they're dancing in a circle, singing about monkeys and bananas. And I thought, what a wonderful, joyous group of people, right? Like they were just so full of life and hope. And for me at like 20, I was like, wow, I've never seen that in church. My people just sit in the pews very quietly and don't even clap. And here they were dancing in the streets. I think that began my love or fascination with Francis. Because what he talks about is becoming part of the world around us. That in everything we encounter, we can encounter God and experience the presence of the Holy which is, which is what the book of Job says in these last chapters. So how many of you remember the book of Job and the story? So you remember the story, right? You remember the first chapter and the last chapter. The first chapter is that God and Satan, the defender, the prosecutor, have an argument over whether there are actually people 
who even when confronted with all the worst in the world will not give up God. And so they decide to test this on Job. And so first they kill his animals, then they kill his children, then they take away his land. And then Job is left in the garbage heap with nothing, just sitting there crying and his three friends show up. So that's chapter one, right? What happens between one and chapter 38? That's the part y'all don't remember, right? <laughs> In chapters 3 through 37, those friends who were really good and came and sat in the garbage heap with Job opened their mouths. Like if they had just kept quiet and been kind, it would have been a totally different story. But they tried to tell him that it was his fault that all the bad things happened to him. And Job kept arguing back, it is not my fault. I didn't do anything wrong because the reading of the story tells us he was the most righteous man around. And so they argue back and forth about whether Job did something wrong. And as it progresses, this argument, Job gets upset and tired of his friends. And so he starts demanding God. He starts saying, I want to talk to the one who can answer this question for us about how this happened. And that's when we get to our chapter, chapter 38. So there's a lot in between that you might want to read. In chapter 38, it says, God steps out of the whirlwind. Can you picture that? Like, you probably can't because you're not from the Midwest. But being that I've experienced tornadoes, like the image of that whirling storm and God walking out of it to you is like also my worst nightmare because I experienced a tornado when I was little. But it's a powerful image, right? That this tornado is what God was riding on, right? That God was zooming on the top of that tornado like a teenager in a first car and stepped out into the world. Now, at this point, we all are like, well, let's put on our kind, compassionate hats, right? This is where God hugs you in your in his arms. This is where God surrounds you with love and tells you that everything is going to be okay. Well, that's not the God we get in this scripture. The God in this scripture comes out and asks Job, all right, I want you to listen to me closely. I want you to understand. I want you to think about what I'm saying. And then he says, where were you? And he goes into this completely beautiful, wonderful description of God playing with the entire universe. Of God being present from all the moments, from the beginning to the end, dancing with dolphins playing with mountain goats. The part we're looking at today has God at the beginning. God says, where were you when I created the earth? When I set it on its foundations, where I built the boundaries for the sea and land, where were you? Do you know who did all that? Now, as a pastoral care perspective, this is not a very comforting answer. Like, it is not the answer you want when you've lost your entire world. All your family is gone. You've lost all your money and wealth and house. And you got nothing left. You don't want God to come in and tell you where were you 
and explain the beginning of creation. But maybe there's something about God doing this that allows Job to change his mind. To see that God was present in everything. From the beginning to the end. In all those little bits that we don't even know happened. That God was there. And if you think about this description that, that God gives. It's like really amazing. Because it sounds very different from how we think we would describe it if we were to use our scientific brains and all we learned in school. And yet it basically says the same thing. When I was in seminary, I ended up taking the book of Job at the same time I was taking this class called um, the origins of creation and the origins of creation class brought in three scientists each week to explain to us about evolution in, in all its varied forms from physics to biology from archaeology i mean and they were university of chicago scientists all right coming to talk to us the other half of the class was theologians and biblical scholars coming in to talk about what do the scriptures say in relationship to those words of science. And what I began to hear and experience wasn't necessarily the words people were saying, okay? But this sense of how just purely amazing creation is. Like the fact that when God's laying out that we are part of this bounded universe. But what the scientists taught me is that the building blocks in us are the same building blocks in the sun and the moon and the stars. That all the elements that make up who we are and lead to our own being are the same elements that make up all of everything else. That we just got lucky to be on this planet that had the right circumstances to make it possible for life to grow and flourish in a multitude of forms and places. And all of our scriptures today talk about that. That's what Francis sings in his song, which he wrote. At the end of his life, he was very ill, and his best friend, Claire, who started her own um, monastery, the poor Claire's who rejected the person from the other week, but we'll ignore that part, because it's when Claire was still alive. They built Francis a hut to stay in for when he would come to visit. Because Francis's life after he came into his identity was to travel around Italy and talk about who God was and how we were to live and to bring that joy and zest for life. I don't know if they sang the banana monkey song, but I know that they sang constantly, that they were full of life and joy and they brought it to everyone. And when they were doing this, he traveled everywhere. And as he got older and got sicker, he got to a point in his life where he was, um, and it's weird for us because he would have been younger than me, but you got to remember it's the 1100, so medicine was different then. So he was glowing blind in his 40s. And so in this last part of his life, he's blind and he gets really sick. And Claire has this cabin for him that he stays in. And that's when he wrote the canticle to Brother Son. That in that point in life where he couldn't even go out into nature at that point because he was so sick. When he couldn't see the flowers blooming, 
where he could make out light and dark, but wouldn't have been able to make out sun and moon. It's at that point that he writes that song, the song that we sing and has meaning to us. I've been trying to think of what can be our application for these sermons over the next few weeks. And in the last three weeks, I have watched four or five different Earth Day services. And in the good ones, they showed a video of local organizations that were working to change the lives of people and the environment. And so I want to share with you, because that meant I learned about all these ones that were out east, and I don't know anything about California. So I had to do some exploring. And I discovered this organization in Oakland called Planting Justice. And I don't know if you've heard about Planting Justice, but it started in, um, now I don't know Oakland very well, so you can like correct my understanding later. But from what I understand that um, it's like Chicago, they redlined people. And so they ended up caging in black people in a certain neighborhood. Um, and those, the people in that neighborhood have lived there since World War II. So we're going on fourth and fifth generation living in this neighborhood. Well, into that neighborhood, Planting Justice came and started by creating nurseries, creating gardens, and inviting the neighborhood to come and work in those gardens and nurseries. But the thing that makes Planting Justice so incredible is that they decided that they wanted a lot of their workforce to be formerly incarcerated individuals. And so they started by creating a system with the local prison, San Quentin, in which they taught people how to garden. And the hope is if you make it through the gardening program in the prison, like you have to make it through it. You can't like give up on it. If you make it through it, they promise you when you get out a job at the, at the nurseries. And so they have created this system where they go to the poorest, which I didn't talk about with Francis, but one of his goals was to teach us about poverty, that, that it is important to be in relationship with all the people that have been left out. And that's why he gave up his father's wealth and threw him in his clothes because he wanted to live among the ordinary people and take care of the lepers and those around him who didn't have anything. And so it, this organization, Planting Justice, thinks that that is what we do, that our job is to take care of those who are most left out. Because, you know, in the recidivism rate in California is 40%. That means of all the people released from prison, 40% of them return to prison. Planting Justice, who does the program in prison and then gives them a job after prison, has a zero recidivism rate. Can you imagine that? That the work they have done to transform people's lives have have changed the lives of those who have the least likelihood of being able to find a job afterwards. And they've done it by hooking them up with the things that help us to change and grow. They gave them a job. They paid them a living wage, so $19 an hour. And they taught them to take care of the world, right? to get their hands dirty by growing stuff. And one of the things that helps us when we are in a bad place is to get out into the world to start growing stuff or to see how incredible creation is. What if we, and I know there's not very many of us, what if we started thinking about our land that way? Have y'all looked behind the church and beside the church? There is so much potential there in that land. 
What could we do to make a difference with that land for the people around us? What could we do with that property to change real people's lives? I want you to dream about that. I want you to pray about that and think about that and share with all of us what comes to you. Because God has an answer. You all have been letting the property sit and marinate. But God has a plan for you. We just need to open up and listen to it. To hear what God has to say to us about what we can do to connect with our land that right now is flowering beautiful weeds that can change the lives of our neighbors, the people around us and in the community. So I invite you to pray, to remind yourself about what Job gets reminded, about what Francis remembers, that God is present in all those little bits of creation in the ocean and the sun, in the stars and the moon, in every being that is. And that our job is what I tried to tell the little ones, to listen, to be quiet and hear so that we can experience what God has in store for us. Amen. <laughs>